Let me also extend my thank you for, for this. Obviously, someone with your schedule uh, coming and spending some time with us is a really big deal for this crowd. So thank you again for that. Well, you have a low bar for a big deal, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so as I understand it, actually, your mom wanted you to be a dentist. So, so did you miss your calling? or? Well, yes. Um, my mother, uh, as some people may know, I grew up in Baltimore, and neither of my parents graduated from college or high school. And so I grew up in a family that was a um, uh, blue-collar family. My father worked in the post office. He made about $7,000 a year, as I recall, when I was growing up. And uh, I was the only child. And uh, my mother uh, gave me, what my father gave me as well, what the most important thing you can get from your parents is unconditional love. If you get the unconditional love of your parents, you probably can achieve almost anything in life. Uh, my parents didn't give me money. And as I was growing up, I, I knew people who were wealthier, and I thought they had an advantage. In hindsight, it was a great advantage to not have wealth. My own three children have the disadvantage that everybody will laugh at of having grown up in a wealthy family, because anything they accomplish, they will say, well, your father bought this for you, your father did it for you. So um, in my case, I, I knew I had to get somewhere on my own. But my mother um, would have been happy if I'd worked in the post office where my father did. Uh, she, her ambitions were modest. But she thought the highest calling of mankind was not private equity, which it obviously is, but, <laughs> but it's to be a dentist. Her theory was that you get to be called a doctor, which is good, doctor, whatever, and you also don't have weekend hours, and you know you can manage your schedule. And she went to a lot of dentists, um, so she thought it was a good thing to do. I just said to her, I didn't think it was for me, and I used an excuse that I was afraid I would get arthritis in my fingers, and therefore I wouldn't be able to do it later in life, so therefore I didn't want to do it. And she, I finally talked her out of it and let me go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing along with, with that love was also a set of values from your time in, in Baltimore, and values important to leadership. What, what are the values you bring from that environment to your leadership? Well, I don't want to overstate my leadership. I got very lucky in life. Um, any of you um, could have happened, what happened to me happened to you. Um, I uh, was, all of you probably know, in, when you're in grade school, high school, college, you, you, you look at people who have great achievements. They were great athletes, they're great scholars. So uh, when I was growing up in Baltimore, I went to a big public high school called Baltimore City College, and there were so many great people there who were great athletes, I wasn't that. Uh, great scholars, I wasn't that. Great extracurricular people, I wasn't that. So I was basically going to be mediocre throughout most of my life, and I kind of accepted that I wasn't going to be a superstar. It is amazing how when you go back, and I've gone back to my high school reunions and my college reunions, how the people who were the superstars often turn out not to be the superstars, and the people like me who will be the least likely person to get anywhere turn out better. So when I went to my 40th college reunion, at Duke, I would have I said there, I was the least likely person to wind up as chairman of the board of Duke or to be the biggest donor in Duke's history. Somehow it happened, I got lucky, and all the people who were superstars then, you know, they kind of said, how did you do this? I, I got lucky. And I got lucky because I wasn't very good at the things that I tried to do. I wasn't that good at practicing law. I started uh, practicing law in New York. And what I really wanted to do was to, to give back to this country. I was inspired by John Kennedy's famous speech. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That was given on January 20th, 1961, a 14-minute speech, brilliantly written by Ted Sorensen with John Kennedy. That was the greatest speech Kennedy ever gave and the greatest inaugural address, I think, certainly of the 20th century. And I heard that when I was in the sixth grade. My teacher said, let's go over this word for word, line for line, so you understand it. And it was really poetry in prose form. And so I didn't have money, and I didn't aspire to it. If you grow up in a modest back uh, family, and in the era before hedge funds, private equity funds, and tech startups, you didn't aspire to go into business. If you were Jewish, you were uh, interested in being a professional, perhaps, but you didn't think you would go make a lot of money. It just wasn't in your mindset. In those days, if you wanted to go into business, you went into a family-owned business, or you went to Procter & Gamble and J.P. Morgan, you worked your way up after 30 years, or you didn't work your way up. So I wanted to be a lawyer and come to Washington and work in, in government. And so I went to work after law school. Uh, at the firm in law in New York, Paul Weiss, which is the firm that Ted Sorensen was at. He was the man that wrote that great speech, and I thought maybe his luster would rub off on me. It was clear uh, <laughs> after a couple of years that I wasn't that good a lawyer. My colleagues would say, you know, you're not that great a lawyer, why don't you try something else? <laughs> and, and my clients would say, you know, are you really sure you want to practice law? So I got the hint that I wasn't good, but I didn't really be a lawyer. I wanted to be in government and help the country. So Ted Sorensen wanted to get me out of the firm, so he helped me get a job. Uh, <laughs> with the man who would be, he said, the next President of the United States, and I could work at the White House just as he did. So I became the chief counsel on the Senate staff for a man who was then running for President of the United States. His name was Birch Bayh. 
Uh, he didn't make it. Um, in fact, 30 days after I joined his Senate staff, he dropped out of the 76 <laughs> campaign. So I wasn't that good a lawyer. I didn't have a political acumen. I joined the campaign if somebody, you know, didn't uh, go very far. So some of you may have this experience in your life where you say, is my career over? What am I going to tell my mother? You know, but and what happened was somebody called me out of the blue and said, would you like to get take an interview with somebody else running for president? I said, rolled my eyes, who? They said, Jimmy Carter. I said, isn't that that peanut farmer from Georgia? Said, yes. <laughs> I said, look, I can tell you one thing. He's not going to be president of the United States. <laughs> um, but I had nothing else to do. So I got an interview. I got the job. I moved to Atlanta. And uh, when I moved down there, Jimmy Carter was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. And when I finished, Carter won by one point. <laughs> so Carter said, like, what was your contribution? But as we have learned recently and throughout the last 50 years or so, White House staff jobs are filled largely by people who work in the campaign. So I worked in the campaign. So I was, became the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States at the age of 27, three years out of law school. Now, I wasn't qualified for the job, but Carter wasn't qualified either, I thought. He <laughs> so, at least that's what I thought then. By today's standards, he's massively qualified. Um, uh, massively qualified. Uh, so, but my, one of my jobs was to fight inflation. I got it to 19%, which you may remember is a record. Nobody's done it uh, better than that. <laughs> but some of you may have this experience as well. What happened was people used to come to me. I had an office in the West Wing. I was the deputy steward I was that in. And I knew the substance of Carter's positions pretty well. And so I went to meetings with him all the time. And I would travel with him, Air Force One, Marine One, Camp David, and so forth. So people came up to me all the time saying, hey, if you want a job, call me up, because they were trying to flatter me. So they always said, you know, if you're a smart guy, you want a job. So the day after we lost the election, and by the way, we wanted to run against Ronald Reagan. <coughs> the reason is this. Ronald Reagan was, in our view, an old, old man. He was 69. Now, I'm 68. So in those days, when I was 31, I thought, 69, this guy must be ready for a nursing home. But <laughs> be careful what you wish for. So we ran against him. He clobbered us. And so the day after we lost the election, you know, I was, what, a couple blocks from here, mm -hmm. um, I started calling all these people and telling me how brilliant I was, how bright I was. None of them ever called me back. None. <laughs> because you're out of power in Washington, you're a dead man. As Harry Truman said, you want a friend in Washington, buy a dog. <laughs> so um, I didn't know what to do. I had gone to a good law school, good college. I practiced at a good firm. I wasn't a great lawyer. I'd worked in the White House. But I thought, oh, surely one law firm in this city would hire me. But nobody would hire me. Because who wanted a guy had only practiced law two years. He wasn't that great at it. So I, in January 20th came and no job. Um, I told my mother I had so many offers, I didn't know which one to take. So I was going to think about them for a, for a while. <laughs> February comes, March comes, April comes, May comes, June comes. My mother said, David, I know you have so many offers. Just take one offer. <laughs> so I finally, there was some law firm uh, felt sorry for me, I think, and they gave me an offer. But they said, you start all at the bottom. You know, forget the White House, forget the experience in New York. So I started at the bottom. And I realized, once again, I wasn't that good a lawyer. Yeah. Because to be good at something, you have to love it. And I didn't love it. I just wasn't that great at it. I was OK in law school, but I wasn't great. And I was modest as a lawyer. And I realized that practicing law was really a business. It had not been a profession as much as it had been when I was in law school. I thought it was a business. So I said, if I'm going to be a business, I should get in the real business. And I was wondering, what, what should I do? And then I read two things that changed my life. Number one, I read that a man named Bill Simon, who had been Secretary of the Treasury under Gerald Ford, had done something called a leveraged buyout. And he bought something called Gibson Greetings Cards from RCA. He bought it, and basically on a leverage buyout in those days, you put in a modest amount of money, you borrowed a lot. He put in $1 million of his own money, and he made $80 million in about two and a half years. So I read about that, and I said, that's better than practicing law. <laughs> but, but I didn't really know what a leverage buyout was. I had to figure it out. So I went down the street, just a couple blocks from here, to a man named Bill Miller, who was Secretary of the Treasury in the Carter years. And I said, look, your predecessor just did a leverage buyout. You must know what one is. Let's do that. We can make some money together. He said either he didn't want me to be involved with him or he didn't want to do it. So he didn't really do it. So I decided I would start one on my own, but I didn't know how to do it. I decided to talk to people who had finance experience. I didn't have any. And then I read one other thing that changed my life. I read that an entrepreneur will start his or her first company largely between the age of 28 and 37. And after the age of 37, it's not unlike a woman's chance of reproducing. It goes down after a certain period of time, while your chance of starting a company goes down after a period of time. And so I read that when I was 37. I said, I better do something. So I recruited three people who knew something about finance, two from Marriott, one from MCI. I mumbled at having money. We're going to do leverage buyouts. They left their jobs because I just they didn't like them. And when they showed up, I said, I meant to say I was going to get the money. I didn't really have the money. So I then raised $5 million. And um, 
and two million dollars to operate the company and three million to invest. That was it in 1987. Now it's a company that's grown to be one of the largest in the world, managed 200 billion dollars. So what, would you, what did we do that made it work? Um, in any company, if you look at it, what, you have to do something distinctive. Um, and what we did was really this. The private equity world was a mom and pop business. When KKR did the famous RJR deal in 1989, they only had seven people. That's because the partnership agreements in those days said if you're managing a buyout fund, a venture fund, a mezzanine fund, you can only have one fund. And 100% of the time of the people has to be devoted to managing that fund. So I decided I would change the rules, but in, not ask for uh, permission, but ask for forgiveness later. So after we raised our first fund of $100 million, I said to my partners, you manage this fund. I'm not the investment guy. I will raise the money for other funds, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a family of funds that had never been done in private equity, but had been done by Fidelity or Vanguard or T. Rowe Price. We'll have a fund that's a buyout fund. You guys manage this. I'm going to go raise the money and recruit people to run a mezzanine fund, a venture fund, a growth capital fund, a real estate fund. And then I'll create a family of funds. And then after we do that, I will go around the world and I will build a European arm, an Asian arm, a Jap Japanese arm, and globalize it. So what we did is, I came up with the idea of essentially of institutionalizing private equity by making it not a mom and pop business, but a real business that, was, that could survive the founders and was more institutional and then globalizing. Now at the time, if I were to tell people, guess what, um, we have just raised a $100 million fund, now I'm going to build a global business, they would laugh. So I didn't tell people that, I just kind of went ahead and did it. And I was willing to go on the road and beg for money, and I hadn't been a fundraiser before, but I just went out and I begged for money around the world. I went to typically 70 countries a year asking people for money. Uh, I was more successful the further I got away from Washington. I, <laughs> I didn't raise that much in Washington because people knew me. Uh, but uh, I would raise more money in Kuwait or Brazil or something. And then our track record was good. We averaged a gross internal rate of return of about 27% a year over 30 years. There you go. So that's a good rate of return. So my partners who were investing the money uh, really were doing a very good job. And, and so we built the business and that's, that's what happened. Then what really happened, to, to, just to finish this story, um, Forbes wrote an article about my partners and me when I was 54, I think it was, and it said we were worth billions of dollars apiece, and they kind of outed us because we were a little bit under the radar screen in the national wealth creation world. And um, so I kind of went back and did calculation. I said, yeah, probably we are worth a lot of money. Um, so I decided that uh, here's what I could do. I, I, I would, had lived two-thirds of my actuarial life. Um, you know, if you're a white Jewish male, you probably have an actuarial life, uh, if you get to 54, of about 83, 84, something like that. My father made it to 85, my mother made it to 86. So I said, okay, I've now lived about two-thirds of my expected actuarial life, so here's what I can do. I can keep making more money, and then I can die as the richest person in the cemetery, but I wasn't sure that's so good. So here's what you do if you have a lot of money. You can be like the ancient pharaohs and build a pyramid and take all your wealth in the afterlife, be buried with it. There's no evidence you really need it in the afterlife. So I decided that wasn't a good idea. So then what do you do with the money? Okay, so you can then spend it. You can buy lots of homes and artwork and every accoutrement you can want, but how, much, how many things do you really need and how much more pleasure do you get? So I decided I didn't want to do that. So then you're left with three options. One, you can give it to your children, um, and there's no evidence if you give a child a billion dollars that he or she is going to win a Nobel Prize for helping the world. So I figured, you know, my children may not agree with this, but I give them a good <laughs> education and they should do things on their own and they shouldn't depend on my money. So then if you're not going to give your kids all your money, then what are you going to do with it? You either give it away while you're alive or you give it away while you're dead. Now I wasn't sure that I would be at a place when I'm dead that I could see what my executor was doing with the money. <laughs> so that meant I was going to give away the money while I was alive. And around that time, Bill Gates called me and said he was starting the giving pledge where people give away half their money. And I said, look, I'm going to actually give away all my money. And so I signed the giving pledge where 40 of us who initially signed it. And I then began to devote a significant amount of my life to giving away the money, but not just giving it away and writing a check, but trying to be involved. So I, I tried to be involved by being on the board or giving my time or my energy, my ideas. And so now about half my time is now spent at Carlisle and half is spent on philanthropic things. So I chair the Kennedy Center board, as many of you may know, and I chair the Smithsonian board now, and I guess I chair the Library of Congress board. I chair the Duke University board. And, I uh, chair the Council on Foreign Relations, so a lot of different things uh, I'm involved with, the National Gallery of Art, I'm on that board now, and I, I you know, try to give these people my time, my energy, my ideas, and, and obviously they want my money as well, but I recognize that. Um, so I, I enjoy it, it's a great pleasure in my life, and I, interestingly, I, I measure my success by doing this in one way. When I um, was doing all this, when I was building Carlisle, making a fair amount of money, my mother would never actually call me up and say to our only child, you know, I'm really proud of you because you're making a lot of money. She never actually, she never had any money, but she didn't really think that making a lot of money was 
such a great thing. When I started giving it away, she would call me regularly and say, David, I just read you gave away money. Thank you. That's a good thing. You've actually learned something. You're doing something useful with your life. So I call it the, the mother test. And um, the mother test is if your mother, particularly if she's Jewish, thinks that you're doing something useful, you know, what more do you want in life than that? What more? Uh, Thomas Jefferson said life's about the pursuit of happiness, but pleasing your mother is uh, one of the great pleasures of, of your life. And uh, I, I had wanted to cap this by, um, I, I gave up, I turned out at, as the chair of the Duke board in uh, last year. And I was going to uh, uh, go to my last uh, time as the Duke board chair. And I called my mother and said, would you come to this? It's my final time. I'd gone to Duke on a scholarship. I remember when she dropped me off there, she said, uh, you know, you really think you can make it here? You, you know, you really, you know, you don't fit in. You don't have any money. Everybody else has money. And I, I said, okay, I thought I could fit in. So I wound up as the chairman of the board. I wanted her to see my cap my time. And so I called her and said, look, please come to the final ceremony. I'm, uh, you know, I'd like you to see it. She said, well, okay, well, who's the commencement speaker? I said, well, actually, I'm the commencement speaker. She said, <laughs> she said, couldn't they get Oprah? <laughs> she said, no, they couldn't get Oprah. They had Oprah they before. Me. They got me. They got me. So I, um, I, 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 I wanted to give the speech uh, in her honor because it was going to be on Mother's Day. And uh, I wanted to talk about the importance of mothers. So um, I did, uh, and then sadly, two weeks before she died, and so I gave the speech, and I said I'm going to dedicate my life, which I am, to, 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 to kind of giving back even more than I've done, because I want to you know, thank my mother uh, for all that she did, and my father as well. So I made the mistake of not uh, doing enough visibly to thank them when I was uh, doing all this. So for example, um, my father died uh, when he was 85, about five years ago. And I didn't think of doing this when I was alive. So after he, he died, it occurred to me he had been a Marine. And so I decided, okay, uh, the Iwo Jima Memorial is falling apart a bit. I will put up the money to fix it and do it in his honor, which I did, but I sadly didn't do it while he was alive. So I didn't want to make the same mistake with my mother. So on um, the Smithsonian board, uh, they were redoing the, uh, the Renwick, and I said, I'll put up the money to help get it done. And so um, they, they named uh, the big gallery after her or something. And so I, I uh, brought her up uh, the night of the dedication. I didn't tell her in advance, and then she went up there and she saw her name. Uh, there and um, you know she was very happy she never had anything named after before but she didn't live for more than a year afterwards so I just wish I had done more so I hope all of you whose parents are alive still you'll do something in some way to honor them for the good fortune you've had and I wish I had done more Wow Wow so I've got to tell you when I thought about the values question I didn't know where you'd go, but I think, <laughs> but, uh, but I think going and rooting it back to honoring your mom and your dad. The most important value was this. This was a PNC bank. See, I had oh. My, see, <laughs> see, I've had PNC from the beginning, so it's uh, my my checking account. Is now here. that is so a what good more value. value <laughs> <laughs> what greater value can you have than being a PNC uh, de depositor and uh, you know investor? Well, right? th thank you. For, are they taking care of you? Is right. My, They've done a great job. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this. So you talk about raising money. You talk about being a financier, making a lot of money for not only your partners and yourself, but, but your investors. The flavor of the day in the corporate world is corporate social responsibility, impact investing, and, and the rest. Do those two, in your mind, come together? You, you've really yeah. extended them in terms of your own personal right. philanthropy. Um, it's a very uh, complicated question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say during the 19... Uh, 70s and 80s, um, Milton Friedman's view, which I think Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan largely had as well, in a sense, is that the corporation's main responsibility is to the shareholder. So get the highest return for the shareholder and let the shareholder do what he or she wants with the money. And that view, I think, permeated American society for 25 years or so. I think now people recognize that corporations have a social responsibility beyond just getting the highest rates of return for their investors. So um, in our firm, we try to give back. We let everybody get a certain amount of money, give money away, and then we match it. We have certain projects that we're involved with. We also give people time off to um, do things. But we also want to, when, when we invest money, we want to do it with a socially responsible um, uh, mind, uh, view in mind. So uh, we do want to, like when I started Carlisle, I said, no guns. We will never invest in guns. No alcohol, no tobacco. And, 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 and no gaming. So we've never done that. 
And um, you know, I I wish we uh, you know were more vocal about it. We didn't we didn't invest in these companies. I just didn't think they were appropriate, but we didn't. Uh, but you can do more. I think in the early days, private equity was seen as not worrying about shipping jobs offshore, wasn't worried about environmental things. We have a very uh, large ESG uh, program now to make sure everything is consistent with certain socially responsible uh, principles. But uh, we don't have a sustainability investment fund or a social impact fund. And for those who don't follow that, a social impact fund is more or less a fund that is designed to get uh, to, to invest in companies that are, um, let's say, sustainable or have social, certain social responsibility uh, values, um, and you're willing to take, theoretically, a lower rate of return. So if in private equity today you're trying to get a net internal rate of return of 15 percent per annum, you might say, well, if you do something socially responsible, we're going to get a 12 percent, but the difference is going to make you go to heaven. Okay? <laughs> so um, we, we haven't adopted that yet because we wanted to say that everything we do is socially responsible. But we have looked at whether we will raise a social impact fund that is more just focused completely on that. And, and I, in, in my own family um, investment operation, are, are pursuing things that will do that. In other words, Carlisle hasn't yet adopted one. It, it may, but uh, I'm, I'm setting up something out of my family office that will do that. But I do think it's important. Um, I do think that shareholders um, care more about just getting the highest rate of return. So I think all corporations today are focused on, on these kind of things as they should be. Got it. Got it. And so you, you do see the generational shift there. Yes. I think my generation, uh, I'm now 68 years old, my generation grew up in a time when shareholders were focused, were, were, were interested in getting the highest rate of return and, and uh, so forth. Now I think people my children's age, I have three children, they are more interested in doing things that are seen as socially responsible. So I have a daughter, for example, one of my uh, two daughters, who is interested in uh, food uh, investing, which is food that's you know, socially responsible, avoid certain kinds of uh, meat and other things and and so she has me looking at all these deals that she tells me are going to save the world and make the world better I don't know if it will the food doesn't taste as good as I like it to taste but it, <laughs> but uh, but you know I, I might feel better I don't know by, by investing in this stuff but anyway my children are much different and they're, they're more interested in that and as they should be that's great that's great so in your platform you know and in terms of the work that you've done in what I'll call the American community you've come in contact with a lot of leaders and I'm reminded of the saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right. And these leaders that you've come in contact with, do you see at least a, a thought to being respectful of the power that they have in their actions and their thoughts and behaviors? I think there's a greater sense of that than before. Um, look, I, what I look for in leaders, and I think people who are leaders um, are people who have certain principles and so forth, but uh, I, I I admire people, Bill Gates, for example, he made an enormous amount of money, but now he's basically giving it all away. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, people who are great leaders are people that um, have some sense of social responsibility. They are people that have some degree of humility. I think arrogance doesn't go as far as humility does, um, with some exceptions. Obviously, there are some people who are more arrogant than I think they should be. I think humility is a great virtue. When I'm looking to hire people, these are the things I'm looking for. Reasonable intelligence. I don't want a genius. Managing genius is impossible. <laughs> I, want, I, I have hired geniuses. The geniuses are just too hard to deal with. They're just, you know, they're no. close to the verge of insanity. I mean, in some ways, they're just too difficult. I want smart people, but I don't need geniuses. I want people who are hardworking. I do think that to accomplish something nine to five, five days a week is hard. If you're going to do something really worth doing, it probably takes more time than nine to five, five days a week. So I'm looking for people willing to work hard. I'm looking for people that uh, want to do things as a team, uh, not just do it on, on its own, because private equity is not an not a, uh, individual sport, it's a team sport. I'm looking for people that have some humility. I'm looking for people who know how to communicate or I think have the ability to communicate. And think about this, all of life is really about persuading somebody to do what you want. Um, you know, you can uh, be Albert Einstein to come up with E equals MC squared, but unless you can convince people you're right, it doesn't mean anything. So there are three ways you can influence people and persuade people. And I mean persuading your spouse, your partner, your children, your business colleagues, anybody. You, how do you persuade them? There are three ways. One, you learn how to communicate orally. People can make great speeches. They know how to say things in a way that will move people to do what you want. So I'm looking for people I think can learn how to do that. Secondly, I'm looking for people that know how to write the king's English. Um, a tweet, in my view, is not English uh, necessarily. Uh, I think that. I'm looking for people that actually can write something. You know, Jeff Bezos has a very good technique. He doesn't have any PowerPoints in his meetings. 
to, for a meeting, you have to prepare a memo that people will read that says, here's what you're you know, trying to talk about. And that's much better because <laughs> when you learn how to write, you can be more persuasive and get people to do what you want if you're good at writing. And the third way to persuade people is lead by example. That's the most important way. When George Washington was at Valley Forge in 1777, he could have stayed at the Ritz-Carlton if he wanted to, but he didn't. He stayed with his troops and led by example. And so I think if you're going to try to persuade people, learn how to write, learn how to talk, and learn how to do something by example. So I'm looking for people like that. I'm also looking for people that have a high degree of ethical commitment to doing the right thing, don't want to cut corners. And I'm also looking for people that want to make money for the right reason. If somebody comes in to me and says, look, um, I want to buy a couple houses, I want to buy get the best art collection, I, eh, it might not be what I want to hire. I want somebody that will say, I want to do something with my life other than just making money. And you know, all of us uh, in this situ life are, you know, don't really know why we're here. You know, you can believe that God put us here for a reason or whatever you might believe how we got here. At some point, everybody in his or her life says, what am I doing here and how do I justify my existence on the face of the earth? What have I done to justify my being here? And at some point, typically when you reach, you know, closer to my age, you begin to say, what am I going to do that actually I can say I'm proud of having done, my children will be proud of, my parents will be proud of, my spouse will be proud of, my partner will be proud of, or, and, and, and I'll leave a legacy. So I ask people all the time, what would you want to have written about you in your own obituary. Suppose you were going to write your own obituary and you knew you were going to die tomorrow. Would you want people to say he had a lot of money or she had a lot of money or she bought a lot of art or he bought a lot of art? Or would you want them to say he or she gave back to the community, made the community, the state, the neighborhood, the country a better place? Well, obviously the latter. But you think about what you're going to do. And the mistake I made is I, did, I started this path a little bit late in life. So I'm rushing to kind of make up for not having done more when I was in my 20s or 30s. When I got inflation to 19%, that wasn't helping the world, right? <laughs> so I try to tell people to think about what you're doing. I try to tell young people. I talk to a lot of college kids and, 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 and graduate students about making certain that part of their life is giving back to society. And they will feel much better about that than the money they're going to make. Uh, yeah, it's fun to make a lot of money because it gives you certain freedom. But in the end, uh, I know so many tortured billionaires who have billions of dollars and they just have no pleasure, they, they don't give it away, they don't really get the pleasure anymore of spending it, they have no friends, they just realize everybody's just up, you know, being nice to them because of their money. It's a very sad life for many of them. The, the happiest people I know are, are, are often people who have no money uh, because they have you know, different values. So I try to look for people that kind of, I think, learn how to give away their money and do something useful with their lives. So you invoked earlier you know, the notion of Kennedy and his famous speech sort of giving you a platform to think about, you know, your life and your future. And you, and you talked a little bit about some of the present day leaders we have in, in, uh, in office. And with tweeting and social media and everything, do leaders need to be made of different stuff, in your view, from then to now? Well, people have debated for centuries. Are leaders born or are they made? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I suspect that it's a combination of both. That clearly, uh, you can be born with some characteristics that your parents might have had. Maybe if your parents were great leaders, maybe you'll be a great leader. But on the other hand, I've seen great leaders have children who aren't such great leaders, so you never know. Um, I think you can make yourself a great leader, and you can um, you know, think about what you're doing to impact others. I, I think, in, in, as I said earlier, you don't have, it's, you're not necessarily born with it. I wasn't gifted as an athlete. I peaked when I was seven or eight. I was very good at six and seven. <laughs> I was a very good baseball player at six or seven. When I, at eight or nine, I stopped growing, and so other people were just, I wasn't that good as an athlete. And, um, and as a scholar, I was okay, but I wasn't first in my class or anything. I, I have given people an example of something that I, I, I would, I'll repeat it here. Very often, if you have um, modest abilities, average, maybe slightly above average, if you work hard and you try to get somewhere, you can accomplish much more than somebody who's naturally gifted. Now, I'll give you an example. When I was in the Carter administration, I got lucky to be in the White House because I worked in the campaign. They didn't do a survey of the best 27 years old in the, in the country. They just, I happened to be in the campaign and my boss was the domestic advisor. In the administration, there was a person who had a resume that I would have died for. First, he went to Harvard College, summa cum laude, pretty impressive, Rhodes Scholar, Yale Law School, Editor-in-Chief of the Yale Law Journal. Supreme Court law clerk and also got a PhD from Berkeley in economics. Okay. Um, and he was also an athlete. So, and he was blonde haired, blue eyed, and built like a, you know, Adonis. So I kind of said, 
this person is wonderful. How could I ever compete with this person, which I couldn't. So every time everybody saw his, his resume in the Carter administration, they would offer him a new job. So he'd keep rising up and up and up. And then when the Carter administration was over, everybody see this resume, and he kept getting a new job every year. Because people look at the resume, they look at him and say, he's handsome, he's charming, he's everything. Well, at the age of 50, he had, had like 30, 30 different jobs, because every time he was getting promoted. But he didn't actually accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. And he had a... You know, he ultimately he got fired from various jobs that he had. He doesn't, didn't accomplish anything because it came too easy for him. He was just so good looking and, and, and good at the early age. So it's better to probably peak when you're 68 than to peak when you're, <laughs> when you're 28. So I tell young people, you don't have to peak at the beginning. And how many of you um, were first in your high school class? Probably, all right, a couple, okay. How many of you were not first in your high school? Okay. So um, most people, if you go back to your reunions and you look at people who are first in your class, you say, geez, is this all they became? Because very often, right. early on, there's exceptions, but very often the people who have such, uh, it's, it's easy for them early on, they just don't work as hard later in life. And as I tell young um, scholars, the trick in life is not winning the first third of your life. It's the winning the second and third third of your life. If the first third of your life, you're a Rhodes Scholar, Supreme Court clerk, you're everything, you're going to coast the rest of your life on your resume. And if you are um, doing all these wonderful things, you're All-American this, you're All-American that, uh, you might coast. So how many see, uh, great athletes have we seen, All-American athletes, who after they finish college or maybe a little bit in the pros, they don't accomplish much anything, of anything in their life. It's the people that keep plugging along, you know, that, that the tortoises that kind of, at the time they get to be 68, they, they've accomplished something. So I tell young people, if you're not first in your class, you're not a great athlete, you know, life isn't over for you. And as George Bush famously said when he gave the uh, commencement address at Yale, um, all of you who are A students, congratulations. All of you who are B students, congratulations. All of you who are C students, you might be President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to throw it open. I know there's a ton of questions out there for you. So with, with your aspiration to, to do great things and, and frankly to help this country out, have you ever considered running for office? Well, um, the bar has been lowered. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no doubt that everybody who is anybody, to, or even, even nobody, you look in the mirror today and you see a President of the United States because, you know, look, um, some of you are members of the Economic Club of Washington. And, um, and, and as you know, I'm the president for about 10 years. And I took the job from Vernon Jordan. Vernon Jordan called me up and he said, David, come over and see me. So I went to his office in New York, and he's locked the door, and he said, David, you're not getting out of here until you replace me as the president of the Economic Club of Washington. <laughs> I said, Vernon, what is the Economic Club of Washington? <laughs> he said, it's 100 people, and you get a, you, you, all you have to do is get one business speak, speaker a quarter, you, and, and, you, and you invite them, and they make a speech. Then you get the members and uh, uh, have questions. You get the cards. You ask the person the, the question on the cards. That's it. One, one, so four, four speakers a year. He said, do it for a couple years. Said okay, he's very persuasive. So I realized after a couple times that most business people are very boring speakers, and the questions that came up in the audience weren't so wonderful either. So I would take the questions that were coming up and I would pretend I was reading a question, but I was making it up. And I, was, I was making up something that was humorous to live in the audience, so, and people liked it. So I, I junked the format and I just went to the interview format, and that led to the Bloomberg TV show and so forth. But one time I was looking for a speaker and I, you know, I couldn't find anybody that I was thought was appealing. And somebody in the club said, how about Donald Trump? I said, come on, I want a serious business person. <laughs> I said, no, no, he'll be a big draw. He's got a TV show. And I said, never watched it. So anyway, I, I, sent, I knew him a little bit. So because when I had gone to uh, Mar-a-Lago, you don't have to be a member of Mar-a-Lago, despite what you might think. My parents lived down in West Palm Beach. And when we had birthday parties or anniversaries or whatever, graduations, I would rent uh, a little room at the Mar-a-Lago. And then every time we'd, we'd have a party there, um, this guy with the yellow hair would show up. And he would photobomb the photos. So I noticed all my pictures with my, my parents and my relatives. Um, I have Donald Trump in the middle of them. So I'm saying, he'd always come along and want the picture taken. I didn't, I didn't want him in the picture, but he was there. Okay. So he got to know me. And, uh, you know, he, I never, he never did any business with him. But, um, so I wrote him this letter. said, Dear Donald, you may remember me from Mar-a-Lago. Uh, would you uh, be willing to come down here and, and then let me interview at the Economic Club in Washington? So he wrote back right away, faxed it back, said, yes, I'll be there. Just tell me the time. So he came down, and in the uh, green room, he said, David, ask me anything you want, but two things, uh, ask me for sure. One, ask me if I'm going to run for president. I said, president what? He said, president. I said, <laughs> I said, Donald, 
trust me, I've been around looking. You're not going to be president of the United States. Don't do that. Um, and uh, he said, well, I'll try to help my brand. And then, uh, what's the other question? Ask me if my hair is real, and then you can feel that hair. So I said, I don't know if I want to feel it, but I'll ask you about it. Anyway, we had the interview. Um, he liked the interview. He told me it was the best interview he had. And then he um, called me the next day and said, David, I'm going to make you an honorary member of Mar-a-Lago. It was great. Okay. And um, you should know this is the highest rated show in the history of C-SPAN. It was covered live. Mm -hmm. So I called the president of C-SPAN and said, what were the ratings? They said, there are no ratings. Nobody can know. <laughs> so, um, so to answer your question, um, I think there are a lot of talented people who are better able to do it and probably and maybe somebody a little bit younger. Um, I think to run for office today, you really have to be willing to uh, do a lot of things that are complicated and difficult. You know, it's a fun job if you, if you get it, but getting it is not that easy. So I think uh, there's modest demand for me to run for office, and I think I will um, succumb to that modest demand and, and stay where I am. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's take questions from the audience. I see Lyle's there. Uh, hi, David. Uh, you support a tremendous number of things, most of which people don't even know about. But the thing that you've uniquely supported uh, is patriotic for you. And we haven't talked about it today. Right. So, would you talk a little bit about how you came to patriotic? Right. Let me explain what that is. Um, and remember, uh, philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. So, I do <laughs> tell people to do things that you can, even if you don't have money. Most of the money that I give away, 90% of it, is to educational institutions in, in this area or in colleges or universities that I've been involved with or to medical research. And that's not unusual. Most people who are very wealthy do that. And so if I give $50 million to a university program, it doesn't get any attention, nor does it really deserve any. Uh, for some reason, when I give relatively modest amounts of money to the cause that I've now labeled patriotic philanthropy, it gets a lot of attention. And like most things in life, it happened by serendipity. And what happened was this. I, like everybody, I wanted to give back to the country, but I wasn't focused on what to do with my money other than medical research, education, things like that. I heard about the Magna Carta being auctioned off, and I said, how can you auction off the Magna Carta? I assume it's in London somewhere. The Queen is sitting with it or something. But, so it turns out there are actually 17 copies of the Magna Carta that are extant, 15 in British institutions, one in the, in the Australian Parliament, and then Ross Perot had bought one in the early 1980s. Uh, a family that had it in its possession for 500 years went land poor. They put up for sale at Sotheby's. Ross Perot sent his lawyer, Tom Luce, over to preempt the auction. He did. He paid about a million and a quarter for it. Tom Luce rolled it up in a tube, went back through British Customs. They said, uh, what's in that tube? They said, the Magna Carta. Oh, so sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so it was on the National Archives for a while. Ross Perot, for whatever reason, decided to put it up for sale. I heard about it from the curator because I'd gone to this reception, and I said, um, I knew enough to know that the Magna Carta actually wasn't as important in British history as it was in our history because when our colonial charters were set up, they said, you have the rights of Englishmen. And the rights of Englishmen meant the Magna Carta. So when we were in our disputes with the British, um, a lot of the founding fathers would write letters or, or other things saying, we have the rights of the Magna Carta. So I thought one of the, uh, the copies should stay here. So I you know, went to the Sotheby's that night. I didn't want to tell my uh, you know, family, I was going to go buy the Magna Carta. It seems presumptuous. So I, uh, they might say, how much less money might this mean for us? You never know. So, um, but I, I, and I, I won the auction. I bought it. And I, I went out and said to the reporters there that I wanted to give this to the United States government as a down payment on my obligation to give back for my good fortune here. And so it's now at the National Archives. I put it on permanent loan. When I die, it'll, it'll stay there forever. And, and so I then got in the habit of, and other, by the way, I, I went that night to a dinner and uh, the head of Citicorp, and he, I, I said, I'm sorry, I'm late for then. He said, I, I said, I was busy. I just bought the Magna Carta. Oh, so he said, sure, sure. <laughs> so, so he called me the next day. It was on the front page of the New York Times. He says, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were joking, but you don't come to the <laughs> bought the Magna Carta. So, uh, so then what happened is I started getting waves of people who had Magna Cartas they wanted me to buy, and it turned out that they were fake uh, largely. But, so, but I, now I bought other historic documents. I bought rare copies of the Declaration of Independence, rare copies of the Emancipation Proclamation. I just bought James Madison's copy of the Declaration of Independence, uh, the 13th Amendment the Freed Slaves, Bill of Rights, and so forth. And I put all of these in places that people can see them. The theory that if you see them, you might be inspired to learn more about American history, because we know so little about American history. Right now, it's hard to believe, in a recent survey by Annenberg, um, it turned out that three quarters of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. Mm -hmm. And one quarter of Americans cannot name one branch of government. <laughs> turns out that high school sophomores in a recent survey, more of them could name the first three stooges, first names, and the first three names of any of the founding fathers. Another survey uh, 
turned out that 35% of Americans think that Larry Summers was the first Treasury Secretary. <laughs> and 30% of Americans think that George Washington crossed the Rhine River during the Revolutionary War. And amazingly, 10% of Americans in another survey turned out think that Judge Judy is on the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> Which hasn't yet happened. Um, but it might. You never know. Never know. Uh, so I, I tried to do this to kind of explain, to, uh, to give back and kind of educate people a little bit more about it. And then when the Washington Monument um, had its earthquake damage, I said, I'll put up the money. Ultimately, Congress said they wanted to put up some because they needed some credit for doing something. So I said, fine. <laughs> but, and then I tried to fix up the Lincoln Memorial and uh, some other things in, in this area, and then Monticello and Montpelier. On well, the theory that if the place are better, more people will go, they might learn more about American history. We don't teach civics anymore. Uh, I have a theory that very few Americans could pass a citizenship test that immigrants are forced to take if they want to be a citizen. So I, I, I think we should educate people more uh, about, about our country, and that's what it is. It's called, I call it patriotic philanthropy because I'm, I'm trying to remind people of the history of our country, the good and the bad. So, for example, when I put up money for, to fix Monticello, I insisted that the slave quarters be built out so people could know that Thomas Jefferson, for all of his great ideas and so forth, was a slave owner. And the same with, with uh, Mon Montpelier. So if you go to Monticello now, you go to Montpelier, you'll see the slave quarters built out. The same is true in Arlington House. The slave quarters are being built out on the top of uh, uh, the, the Arlington Cemetery uh, up uh, there. And so I, I want very much to have people know the good and the bad of our country. But on the theory that if you know the bad and the good, you maybe we won't relive the bad so much. I'm uh, Robert McCartney from the Washington Post. Um, I wanted to ask you, you talked about corporate social... That was my biggest mistake. I was I had a chance to buy the Washington Post. I, 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 <laughs> Uh, Don Graham called me and said, would you like to do it? I, I, he obviously have a better, richer owner than I, and he's done a great job, but I, that was my big regret. I should have done that. It's a great, great organization. Go ahead. Your question is? We would have welcomed you, but we're quite happy that our <laughs> He's a lot richer. That's one reason. We obviously care deeply about social responsibility, and I wanted to ask you about corporate social responsibility, sort of on a grand scale, in the Washington region. Um, you know, I've been following local government and politics for quite a while, and it's, it's very clear that there's sort of two interrelated challenges for the Washington region as far as businesses' role goes. And that is, the first is that the, the local business community is very fragmented in terms of its role vis-a-vis -vis issues facing the Washington region. And the other one is that the business community just doesn't seem to have much influence over the politicians in terms of addressing re problems everybody recognizes that are regional in nature, such as lack of investment in transportation, lack of coordination on transportation, lack of coordination or investment on affordable housing, workforce development, branding, these are all issues that are very familiar to people in leadership of Greater Washington. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the regional business community, of which you're you know, one of the leaders, you know, could do more to sort of get the region to cooperate more on these issues. I, I wish there was a good and simple answer. There really isn't. Uh, you have three geographic uh, uh, areas, and. It's not, if Washington was one area, if the Washington metropolitan area was one state, I think it'd be easier. But by having three different jurisdictions, often where different political parties are in power, it's very difficult, I think, to get people to pull together. And it, it obviously hasn't happened very much. Uh, Russ Ramsey and a few others have put together a Greater Washington Partnership. You're probably familiar with it. I'm a member of that board. But I, it's going to take a long time. I, 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 I am worried about uh, this. When you think about it, when Washington was created by George Washington, it was his vision, he wanted to be a great n national capital. And what his vision was to have it be like Paris and, and, to, and, and, and London. We haven't really created that because London and Paris are the financial capitals, the political capitals, the business capitals. We really created a political capital, but not a financial capital. And it used to be that there were two power centers in the United States. One is Washington, the political capital, and the business capital, New York. But now there's a third, which is Silicon Valley where there is more and more power and more and more wealth. And I think the Washington community has a hard time getting 
the leaders of Maryland and Virginia and D.C. to cooperate. It's just, it, plus, you've got to deal with the, the Congress as well, which is another entity because they control so much of the first strings of Washington, D.C. I, I don't have an answer. If I had an answer, I would run for office or I would have figured it out. It's not easy. Um, I do think the Washington metropolitan area has done reasonably well in uh, trying to deal with the fact we don't have as many large corporations here or as many wealthy people. If you take a look at the wealthiest people in the United States, there aren't as many of them living here as in Silicon Valley or in New York. It's just modest. Uh, the number of people who signed the giving pledge in this area is roughly three, I, th I think maybe three. A very few number of people have signed it because there isn't much wealth here. Um, and I, I, I have my own issues I would like people to solve, and I talk to the government leaders about it, but they're less um, important than the ones that you're probably addressing. So my main concern all the time I see the mayor is, can you fix the potholes? You know, um, <laughs> how can you be a great national capital when you can't drive from one place all without ruining your car? Did anybody notice potholes here? Yeah. Um, yes. I can't figure it out. There's a rainy day fund in Washington, D.C. government, which is about $1.4, $1.5 billion. And I keep asking the people on the city council and the mayor, why don't you spend that $1.5 for something that it, it really relates to rain because that's where the, uh, <laughs> the, the potholes are. But I, I, I don't understand. I can't figure it out. Has anybody ever been to, uh, uh, to, 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 to some of the roads here? It's just unbelievable. Um, and anyway, it's, it's true in New York, too. And so we build, I, I'm amazed we build these great, wonderful buildings, and then we have these terrible roads to get to them. But I, I wish I had a good, serious answer about, to your question. I just think it's, it's, it's too divided in terms of a government. Um, I think the federal government has too much role in, in, in as well. It's, you're like four entities, the three geographic ones in the federal government. It's too complicated. I think I, I wish I had an answer. We're over here. I'm Rebecca Cooper from Capital Insights. It's true what he says about hiring great communicators. My friend from Congress, Chris Ullman, <coughs> entertained many of us at the uh, Business Hall of Fame. He was the whistling, national whistling champion. So he communicates even better in those ways. Yeah, he's got a book out. He's done a great job. He's our public relations guy. And I hired him uh, from the SEC. Uh, he was at the uh, OMB then. And he'd been the SEC. He's great. He's the five-time world whistling champion. And he worked with John Casey, a really smart guy, but he knows how to communicate. And uh, it, his book is going to be great. But I wanted to ask you, um, looking ahead at the next three years of the Trump presidency or the next seven years, whoever you speak to, um, what do you still want to see accomplished by this White House in terms of growth for the economy that you think is realistic and will actually get done? Um, well, the, the administration is projecting 3% annualized growth. It's very difficult to have a $20 trillion, annual, uh, $20 trillion GDP economy grow at 3% a year. There's no history of it. So I'm nervous about our ability to do this. We also have a smaller workforce than we've had traditionally. So I just think growing at 3% on an annualized basis over 10 years in a row is very difficult. I also worry about uh, the debt. Uh, when I left the White House, uh, we had under a trillion dollars of debt. Now we have $20 trillion of debt, 20 trillion, and we're adding each year annually now about 1.2 or 3 trillion. So it's a lot of debt. The economists don't seem to be as worried about it as I am because they say as a percentage of GDP it's tolerable. But I think it, when interest rates go up, as inevitably they will, it's going to be harder and harder to service this debt. Think about this. Right now, all the money that you and everybody else in the United States pays in taxes comes into the federal government. And that amount of money is enough to pay for Social Security, <coughs> Medicare, and Medicaid. That's it. No defense. No, no anything else, discretionary. Everything else is borrowed money. And how much longer can we go with these entitlements programs taking the, all the revenue? We either have to increase taxes or we have to cut benefits or, or have higher growth rates. And it, it, those are the only three things you can do. So I, I, I worry that we are borrowing uh, too much money. Uh, think about this. You know, we just had a new tax bill, and, uh, and obviously I, you know, it wouldn't be the tax bill I'd write. I think it's going to stimulate the economy, and that might be good. But what we've said in the tax bill is that we are borrowing $1.5 trillion of, of additional debt of money to, to pay for it. Okay, maybe $1.5 trillion over 10 years is tolerable. We have 10-year budgeting in the United States now. And the way this works, and ironically, we, we didn't have this problem. Our debt was smaller before we had the Budget Act of 74. Now that we have the Budget Act and all these other things, the, the debt keeps going up, and we don't have the appropriation bills passed on time. But think about this. What we do is we say this tax bill is going to lose revenue for us in years one, two, and three because it's going to stimulate the economy. We're borrowing money. We'll make it up in years seven, eight, nine, and ten. And then a lot of this revenue will come back with higher growth. But if it doesn't come back in years seven, eight, nine, and ten, we could have a lot more than 1.5 trillion of incremental debt. And I don't think we'll actually be able to wait till the years seven, eight, nine, ten to find out. I think if we have 
you know, deficits going at 1.5 to $2 trillion a year at some point, five years from now, we will have to increase taxes. And I suspect, as George Herbert Walker Bush uh, realized, you have to increase taxes sometimes when you, when you have too much of a debt coming every year. And I, I just don't know whether the tax bill will work. It, it's a short-term fix to some extent. It's a sugar high. Everybody loves sugar highs. But when you have a sugar high go off, as you know from having children, it can have some effect. So I think the administration has the best of intentions. I think they, I'm glad they got a tax bill through. It's different than I would have written. I'm, I, I think the, the tariffs that are proposed are not, not going to be good. I'd be surprised they actually go into effect as, as proposed yesterday. Um, but and I worry that some of the really good people might be leaving the administration and actually have some good uh, um, capabilities in the economics area. But I do worry that the economy uh, just can't grow at 3% a year for 10 years in a row. If we could, it would be okay, but I suspect our growth is going to be closer to 2%. And again, that $1.5 trillion number presumes 3% annual growth. Mm -hmm. If you grow at 2%, you're looking at 5 and $6 trillion of annual uh, increased debt. Does that scare everybody? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Question over here. Hi, David. Uh, David Harrington with the uh, President CEO of the Prince George Chamber of Commerce. Um, so one of my favorite books is uh, Leadership Without Easy Answers by Ronald Heifetz, and he talks about uh, the need for adaptive leadership, and that is managing to sort of nuances and complexity. But in this age of stringent ideology, how do we begin to build uh, cohorts that can lead through some of the nuances that you talked about with having to make some tough choices, uh, but having to build sort of a, some type of collaborative leadership model that gets us through those tough choices. Well, what's the next question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what can I say? What do I think George Washington is saying? I was just did his birthday party, uh, 280th something, uh, Mount Vernon on Saturday with, with Michael Beschloss. And I was thinking, if George Washington's looking down or whatever from wherever he is, He'd be saying, geez, is this what I left behind? I mean, uh, uh, we, we are dealing with sound bites and uh, tweets and social media kinds of things. And, you know, think about this. We had, uh, it's not a perfect document, and it had a, a fatal birth defect called slavery in it. But the Constitution um, has survived, survived for, you know, 200 plus years. It's a pretty good document. Most docu most constitutions don't survive that long, and obviously it had the birth defect of, of slavery in it, so it's not perfect for a long shot. But um, the founding fathers who put together this, if we were putting a new constitutional convention today, to, 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 together today, who would we have in our country that we would have at that convention? It would obviously wouldn't be all white Christian males. Uh, it'd be obviously more diverse and so forth. But who are the people that we aspire, that we look up to? And can we find 55 people that we actually would say, let's put these people together and come up with a better constitution? Uh, today, we often find people who are in, good at sound bites, good at uh, proselytizing things that are, I think don't make a lot of sense. I wish we had more nuanced leaders who are uh, people who had some more, um, I'd say, compromising kind of views and getting things done. I, I don't know the answer to it. I, I, I was surprised by the presidential election. I, you know, I don't know where that's going. It's, it's got a lot of challenges for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I wish good people would go into government. You know, if, if you take a look at the people at the Constitutional Convention, they were the leaders in society then. Today, would you be able to get the, you know, the best people in our country to come together in a Constitutional Convention? I think the best people would say, I don't want to be messing with this. I'll, I'm staying with my, running my university. I'm running my business. I'm doing something else. Um, it's, it's sad that some of the best people don't want to go into government. It's also sad that when they get here, they now realize it's dysfunctional. So some of the people are leaving quickly. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer uh, for it. Okay, we've got, we've got time for one more question. Right over here. Hi. Um, another thing that Washington has a lot of is nonprofit institutions. Um, many of them are represented in this room today. I'm the director of the National Geographic Museum, so I represent a cultural institution. Uh, and I guess my question is about leadership. Oh, by the way, our museum is open today, and it's just a short walk from here. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what museum is that? What museum? The National Geographic Museum. Okay. So um, my question is about nonprofit leadership. You spent a good deal of your career in working with nonprofits right. and 
and philanthropy, what are the qualities that you look for in leadership of uh, nonprofit institutions and particularly cultural institutions? Well, you have to have people that realize that making money isn't the highest priority in life because you're not going to make a lot of money. You have to look at, you have to have people who want to give back to society because obviously if you're working in a museum, your mission is to try to educate people. And I do worry that at some point um, people will not want to fund museums. As you know, everything is dependent on philanthropy to some extent to have these museums. And, and, and you know, I, I worry that sometimes people will say, well, let's just look at it online. Why do we have to go to a museum to see these artifacts? Let's just go online. And the danger with that is this. If you look online, you don't get the same experience. There's nothing like seeing the original artifact, seeing the original fossil, seeing the original uh, book or something, that could, and then inspire people to go back and, and learn more about uh, something. If you're only looking at things online from your room, I'm afraid that uh, you know, we won't be as good a, a society, and I'm also afraid that the, the, the support for museums will go down. Um, the Smithsonian is free, taxpayers support it, and, and that's a great thing. If we had to charge for all the Smithsonian museums, and the 19 of them, we, we wouldn't get as many people attending them. Uh, I, I um, think that museums provide, provide a very important service, but you, to get people who lead those museums and the people serve on the boards, I mean, you need to have people who are willing to give some money and their time and their energy and ideas. And I think Washington does a pretty good job of that. People who tend to come here are not as focused on making money as other things. But it's clear that uh, uh, you, we just need more, more philanthropic support to keep these things alive. Uh, uh, and take the museum, for example. The Muse museum you know, is supported by the uh, Freedom Forum, but it's basically probably going to go out of business to some extent, or will be sh we reduced if not go out of business, because it couldn't compete with, with the Smithsonian Museums, which are free. Um, and even though the museum charged money, it, 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 the money wasn't enough to kind of make people go and go to it. So I, I, I worry about that, those kind of things. But I hope, uh, you know, we still attract a lot of people to Washington to go to the museums. We get about 25 million people a year going to the very Smithsonian museums. But uh, we have to, we always are fighting for more money to, to update the, those museums. Well, you've been so gracious. Thank with you. Your time and your energy and your point of view. Thank you.